Hey everybody, welcome back to your favorite chess channel. Today, I've decided that I'm going to start a new series where we're going to study classical games in chess history. And what better game to start with than the Immortal game between Adolf Anderson playing white and Lionel Kieseritsky playing black that dates all the way back to 1851. Now, Anderson in this game sacrificed all of his major pieces to deliver a beautiful checkmate using only three minor pieces that he had left. In this game, we're really going to take a deep dive on how positional advantage is so much more important than a material advantage. Let's go. Anderson starts off with a standard e4 that's met with pawn to e5. And we already see some fireworks from Anderson playing at King's Gambit here. Black then captures on f4, bishop to c4, practically inviting black to play queen to h4, which he does. King moves to f1, the black pawn to b5, and then white captures that pawn, and knight moves to f6. White knight then moves to f3, attacking the queen. Queen moves back to h6 to get out of there, d3. Black plays knight to h5, protecting that pawn on f4 while also preparing a knight to g3 check. Because if the white pawn captures the knight, it would expose the rook, leaving it completely undefended for black to capture. In order to guard against that move, white plays knight to h4. Because if black now checks after white captures, the knight is interfering between the queen and the rook. Black moves his queen to g5, attacking both this knight and the bishop. In response to that threat, white moves the knight to f5. Black hits back with c6, and then white moves to g4. Now, unfortunately, we all know that in 1851, the internet hadn't been invented yet. So Kieseritsky in this position couldn't exactly Google which move to do next, if you know what I mean. So instead, he plays knight to f6. Black responds with rook to g1. Anderson sacrifices his bishop on b5, which really wasn't doing much there in the first place, to try and trap Black's queen while also developing a strong attack here on the king's side. Black captures that bishop, and white starts attacking the queen. And in this position, even if white is down one bishop, the engine gives white a plus one advantage. From now on, we're going to see why it's so much more important in chess to have a positional advantage rather than a material one. Queen moves to g6, white pushes the pawn to h5, and now the black queen moves back to g5. White's queen moves to f3, which threatens to take black's pawn with the bishop and traps black's queen because that square on h4 right here is protected by this knight. The only move that allows black to keep his queen alive is to go back with the knight to the starting position. Bishop captures on f4, and the queen moves to f6. Knight then moves to c3. Now, take a look here at this position. It's move 16, and black hasn't really developed any of his minor pieces, while white has completed his development and is ready to take that king on. Now tell me, which side would you prefer to be here? Black with the bishop up, or white with the positional advantage. If I'm the one choosing, let me tell you, I would take white's position any day of the week. Next up, black plays his bishop to c5, developing the bishop with a tempo by attacking the rook. But Anderson isn't really interested in that rook. He's got much higher priorities from this position, so he plays his knight to d5, attacking both the queen and also threatening a possible fork on c7. Here, Black's queen does not really have a good square to go to, and it must be careful because if it moves out on that diagonal, then the g7 pawn is hanging and it can be captured with a check. We'll see later on how important this g7 square really is. Queen moves to e5, then knight to g7 is going to fork the king and queen, so the other available squares are c6 or a6. If queen moves to c6, again, the knight will capture that pawn with a check. King to f8 is the only move if you don't want to lose the queen that you tried so hard to protect. Because if the king moves to d8 and then bishop to c7, putting him in check, the queen is forced to take because the king, as you can see, has no available squares to run away to. So, king to f8, the knight is going to go back to making room for the bishop to give a check, and all kinds of tactics are going to be possible from this position. Here, the engine gives white a plus 4.9 advantage. Having all that in mind, Kizaritsky decided to capture on b2, remaining on that diagonal while also thinking of picking up this rook, considering that more material advantage will compensate somehow in the end. Let me tell you, all the material advantage in the world 
cannot save Kizaritsky here. And uh, we kind of see how Black starts regretting bringing his queen out so early in the game while neglecting his other minor pieces. Now, Anderson, having both of his rooks hanging, plays bishop to d6, attacking that bishop on c5. If Black would have captured that bishop, this would be an immense mistake that would have led to a forced checkmate in only four moves. Bishop takes, knight takes with a check, the king can't go to f8 because of queen f7 is going to checkmate him on the next move. So, the only other move to do is d8. See how powerful those knights are? Boxing that king in, leaving him with only one single available square. Knight to f7 is check, king moves to e8, d6, and then moves to d8. Now, the queen has a clear path to deliver that checkmate. Is this a brilliant move from Anderson? Well, it's quite the opposite. Bishop to d6 is a massive blunder from white, tying up the game for black, but luckily for Anderson, as big a blunder as that was, Kizaritsky's is about to be much worse. First, let's take a look as to why exactly that move really threw white's advantage. Now, bishop to d6 is a major blunder because it allows black to capture the rook on a1. Well, this was pretty obvious, right? Anderson saw this too, but he thought that losing both of his rooks wouldn't undermine the attack that he had planned, and he was sure he could deliver a checkmate with his pieces already aligned for that task. But Black doesn't take the second rook. Instead, he brings his queen back to b2. Now that pawn on c2 is very sensitive, ripping open a king's defense. Also, if white captures that bishop, Black is going to capture it back after capturing that c2 pawn. So, white is going to play king to d3 to protect that pawn. Now, Black can take the other rook, and even if white has all the attack power facing the enemy king, he honestly can't do a single thing with it. The best he can do here is to start reducing that material advantage. Like so. But if we step back to reality and take a look at what actually happened in the game, you'll see that black took the wrong rook, capturing the one on g1 with the bishop. Now, we see a beautiful interference move from Anderson, offering yet another rook just to stop the queen from protecting that g7 pawn. Can you see the move here? There you go, pawn to e5. Now black captures on a1 with a check, and the king then moves to e2. Here, in this position, black is up 13 points in material, and according to Stockfish, the game is once again tied. But only if Kizaritsky would play all the engine moves perfectly until the end of the game, which is an impossible task for a human, because let me tell you, you're never going to guess the next correct move in this position. Pause the video here if you think you can guess it. Let me know in the comments if you got it right. Now much to my surprise, and according to the engine, the best move in this position was bishop to a6. Now even at first glance, this move might look a little bit ridiculous, bringing your bishop to a square that's blocked by a pawn while white is threatening to check you from two different places. But this is the only move that could have saved black's game. Because after the knight takes pawn on g7, the king is forced to move to d8. And now, bishop to c7 is no longer checkmate because white has the c8 square available to escape to. Here, the best move for white is to check with the d5 knight, and after the fork, he should take the bishop and not this rook, because that bishop can be a really malevolent piece for white. If knight takes the rook, the king moves to c8, preparing bishop to b6, and cutting white's king off from every available support. Now another reason as to why bishop to a6 is the only move that works if black had played bishop to b7 instead, which is a more natural move if you ask me, at least he's on a diagonal that's actually attacking something. But that's why I'm just an average player and not a grandmaster. Then, white will have forced a checkmate in 7 moves. Knight to g7, placing him in check. King moves to d8. Queen takes on f7, threatening checkmate on f8. Knight moves to h6, opening the path for the rook to defend that square. But white will play knight to e6, check. If king moves to c8, then knight to e7 is checkmate. If the pawn takes, then queen to e7, and then queen to c7 is checkmate. So now we see why bishop to a6 was literally the only move, because it not only cleared that c8 square for the king to escape, but also the b7 square if white decides to play those sequence of moves. Now we see now that the knight to e7 is no longer a checkmate, and here black has a defensible position while also being up two rooks and a bishop. 
But instead of having boring old computers play the beautiful game of chess, we have humans, and humans make mistakes. So here, Black decided to deal with the checkmate threat on c7 by playing knight to a6, reinforcing a defense on that vital c7 square. But unfortunately for Black, in this position, White has a brilliant checkmate in three moves. Tell me if you can find it. A little hint, it involves a queen sacrifice. Congratulations if you did find it. If not, here's the move pattern. Again, we'll start with knight to g7. Now once again, we see how important that pawn was and why it was crucial for Anderson to interrupt the queen's defense over it. King moves to d8, queen to f6, knight captures, bishop to e7, there's your checkmate. And there you have it, the immortal game between Anderson and Kizaritsky from 1851. I hope you like this game, and I hope you realize that studying the classics like this can really improve your overall play. Classical games, honestly, they have everything. They're like an extended lesson of chess. You can learn a lot of chess strategy, but see beautiful attacking games and really great endgame techniques. As always, thanks a lot for watching. We really hope you enjoyed our video. Please like and subscribe if you enjoy our content. Have a great day.